Hi, everyone, and welcome to Episode 8 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by actual FBI cases. In this episode, I get to interview retired Special Agent Bobby Chacon. Bobby served in the FBI for 27 years. During this interview, he talks to us about working in New York on a Jamaican drug gang squad where his and his squad mates efforts disrupted and dismantled the violent Gullyman Posse gang. He also talks about another highlight of his career, being a member and a team leader on the FBI's dive team, conducting search and evidence response at underwater crime scenes around the world. Now, because of Bobby's amazing and varied career, this is one of the longest interviews I've conducted. So I don't want to take a lot of time talking, but I do want to let you know that it will be my birthday at the end of the month. And if you are enjoying the show, I think a nice birthday suggestion would be for you to go to iTunes to subscribe to the podcast. And while you're there, how about giving FBI Retired Case File Review a good rating? Again, only if you're enjoying the podcast. If you're already subscribed, you may have to access FBI Retired Case File Review via the iTunes search bar to get to the page where you can rate and review the show. Thank you to everyone who has emailed me, including my friend in Costa Rica and the United Kingdom, and of course, around the country. Emailed me to say that you love the retired agent profiles and case reviews. Please continue to support the podcast and spread the word about the show to your friends and family. Before we start the show, I just need to remind you that Bobby gave me lots of photos of him during his FBI career, and they're all posted at jerrywilliams.com. Now here's the show. Everyone, I am so excited to introduce you to my guest for today. It's Bobby Chacon, and Bobby served 27 years in the FBI. Hi, Bobby. Hi, how are you? I'm great. I know that you have had a varied career working dangerous drug investigations and then uh, a collateral duty that became a full-time duty with the FBI uh, dive team. Let's take it in chronological order. Okay. First of all, when did you join the FBI and why did you join the FBI? Well, I was uh, in 1985. I started law school in New York, and I was attending law school. And the FBI came around on one, you know, on one of those career days recruiting. And I, uh, my father and brother were both NYPD sergeants, so I had a history of family and law enforcement. And uh, I was thinking about going into the NYPD as well. Um, but the FBI kind of piqued my interest, and then my dad was actually the one that encouraged me to go into the FBI because he said, you know, you probably get treated better and work more interesting cases and things like that. And he was right. And uh, so my dad encouraged me. And then I graduated law school in August of 87. And I already had my appointment letter. It was one of those years I was lucky when Congress had approved a bunch of funding for new agents, a bunch of new agents. And so uh, I entered the academy literally maybe three weeks after I finished law school. It was really hard to staff the New York office. And they had that program where if you requested to go back to New York, they would automatically send you there. So I wasn't one of those ones at Quantico who had to read their, uh, their first office of assignment out of the envelope and stuff because there were five of us in the class that picked New York, and we all knew uh, that we were going to need to go back to New York. So I, uh, in December, just before Christmas of 87, I reported to the New York office, to the um, Brooklyn, Queens resident agency. I was uh, lucky enough to uh, get assigned initially right away to a, a organized crime squad, a traditional Italian uh, mafia squad, and so I worked for two years on uh, the uh, Lucchese family, um, uh, the Ken Rack case, which was Kennedy racketeering. Uh, the Teamsters uh, had controlled two uh, Teamster locals. The, the mafia had controlled two Teamster locals at Kennedy Airport. So uh, a box of cargo didn't move in or out of Kennedy Airport without the mob taking a piece of it. Um, but as the new guy on a you know on a case that on a squad that had you know basically only two cases being worked, half the squad worked one case, half the squad worked the other. And uh, but it was a, just a ton of wires and, and surveillance. And then I slowly kind of got weaned into informants. Um, 
little slower on the Italian side because those are like long-standing informants and the guys have them for decades and you develop a relationship. But I had some really old-time agents um, who, you know, all of whom had gotten their credentials directly from Hoover and were really street investigators, right, before computers and before anything. These guys were, were pen and paper guys. They, they had their little reporter's notebook everywhere they went. And I slowly was able to get weaned on to how to work an informant. You know, um, not so much how to develop informant because, like I said, with the Italians, these guys, you know, they've been, you know, developing them for years and stuff. So uh, it was a lot of surveillance work, a lot of Title III work, and, and, and a bit of, of informant development, informant handling more than development. Well, it sounds like it was a great uh, training opportunity. I mean, it really was. Um, so how long did you do that? For about two years. And then the New York office was starting a new squad back in Manhattan. Um, and I kind of uh, I was kind of seeing the writing on the wall that if I was going to get a more vast experience, I was going to have to move or else I was going to have to stay on this squad for 15 or 20 years before I was going to be in a position to kind of kind of get my own thing going. They started what was called a non-traditional organized crime squad, which at that time in New York meant going after one half the squad was going after Jamaicans and the other was going after the Chinese gangs. And so I volunteered for that squad and my supervisor endorsed me and I moved back into the main office in Manhattan and got on the ground floor of this brand new squad that was taken off and it had a great supervisor and a great primary relief. Uh, and that's why I really started learning how to develop informants. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, it just took off from that. I was assigned to the Jamaican squad, at the Jamaican side of the squad. And I just got really fortunate one day early on. We had a walk-in, um, a guy walk into the office saying he had a bunch of information on this big Jamaican gang that was operating in Brooklyn. And, you know, I sat down and, and uh, I had a, a first grade NYPD detective as my partner, which I was a very, another very fortunate thing. And, uh, it was shortly into the interview. We stepped out and, you know, he kind of knew exactly what was going on and schooled me on it. And this guy was actually part of this gang and there was an internal war going on in the gang. And although he brought himself in as a concerned citizen living in the neighborhood that was just going to give us all, he was giving us such a detail of the inner workings of the gang that my and partner, knew he had to be a member. He had to be a member. And really what it okay. was, as it turned out, him and his three brothers were kind of a breakaway faction of the gang, was trying to take over the gang. And he thought he was going to be smarter than us, right? He was a former Jamaican cop and, and down in Jamaica. And he thought he was just going to enlist our help in getting rid of the other side of the gang. Um, so we played his game for about a year. Um, and we kind of ran him for about a year until... The, 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 the war started getting really serious and, um, you know, he called me one day and said, hey, uh, you're going to hear about, you know, they're trying to set me up. The other part of the gang is trying to set me up. They're going to say that I drove down the block and, and, and shot out of my car and hit a bunch of people and a girl was hitting a little kid. Was hitting. It wasn't true. It's not true. And I said, OK, just, you know, meet us in the office. Come in the office and we'll talk. Well, you know, by the time I talked to my detectives out in the field that worked the precinct, because after a year we knew these guys the precinct level detectives who knew everybody in the neighborhood. We knew our guy actually did the shooting. So we, so what happened when he came in? He never, he never left. We literally <laughs> interviewed him all night. We had the AUSA on the phone. We drew up a complaint and information and we charged him and he did not come in thinking he was going to be spending the next, you know, 20 years in jail. And we had to, you know, kind of get him to that point. And, uh, so it was an all night, one of these all nighters, you know, three, four, five in the morning talking to him. And the AUSA, you know, very next day, first thing in the morning, he was appeared before the magistrate. He got the information signed and we charged him and then he cooperated. He had a brother already. One of his other three brothers was already in state jail. And then and then we got his third brother in custody that same day, the next day. And then. He had one brother that we were, we spent a week trying to get to come in as well, and he said he would. We had a couple of meetings with him, a couple of phone meetings with him, and he said he just had to handle a few things. I think in the back of his mind, he knew he was going to jail too, like his other three brothers, and he wound up getting in a shootout and getting killed with the gang, with the other members of the gang. And he was okay. going to go out in a blaze of glory. He realized his three brothers were in jail. The rest of the gang was kind of winning this, this internal war, 
And, and that was actually my first, like, homicide, where I was actually called out at night to a homicide scene. Here's the guy we've been looking for. He's all shot up 20 times or something. And so there was my schooling in, you know, gang, drug work, homicide. You know, I never thought I would be standing at a homicide, live homicide. So I talked to my dad later on. It just didn't seem to be like things FBI agents do, but it was a new age. All right, so this was a situation, and, and which doesn't happen very often, when your informant actually becomes your subject. Right. And, and, and quickly thereafter became my cooperating witness. It was kind of a uh, you know, process that didn't stop. He was an informant, became subject, became a cooperating witness. All It was very smooth, the transition. I mean, it was, it was one of, like I said, it was one of them all-night interviews, all-night type of things, convincing him. No, he was very not willing to do it. And, and it was one of those things where I really learned from my, this first-grade detective I was working with how to talk to people, how to talk to this guy, how to convince him. And it was not easy. It was... It, you know, we were exhausted. He was exhausted. The, the mental exhaustion sets in, and you're just you're in that interrogation room literally all night long. Sun's coming up the next day, and we're finally making some headway. And you know, and and it was just it was one of those seminal moments of a career where you just, everything just kind of opens up. Your eyes open up and say, "This is what you want to do. This is what you were meant to do." What would you say was the difference between working? Uh, the, you know, the Italian mob and this Jamaican mob, what was the difference? Or was there a difference? Yeah, I think the difference was, well, first of all, the violence. The Jamaicans would shoot at us over a, a $5 bag of crack. Um, the Italians, not so much, right? So they had, we had an understanding with them. I mean, I remember being taken along to talk to the, the boss, Vicka Musso, the boss of, of the Lucchese family at the time. Uh, I went with one of the older agents that we had credible threat against his life we didn't tell him we had overheard it on a title three but that's how it <laughs> happened and right. you know, we, we approached him on a you know here's the boss of the family surrounded by his inner circle his bodyguards and they're all in their sweatsuits and they're hanging out at a handball court in, in queens and you walk up to him and you say you know mr russo we have to inform you we have this credible you know threat against your life he feigns this <laughs> shock on you know and, and it was a very it was one of those movie scenes you know well i don't know why agents Thanks for telling me, but I have no idea why anybody would want to harm me. You know, yes, and, I'm just a businessman. Yeah, you know, and we satisfied our legal, you know, obligation to let him know, and and we walked away. And and but we, you would never have that type of interaction on the with the Jamaicans. Whenever we were in the street working them in Brooklyn, it was always much more high tension, much more looking over your shoulder. Even when you're on surveillance, you will, you know, always knowing that they could and probably would shoot at you because, the, you know, they were all born and raised in Jamaica. It was a much more violent society. Um, the, there was much less respect for the police. and It, it was much different. It, it, was, it was in that in that sense. Um, the other thing was, and you know, when I was working the Italians, they weren't, co most of, many of them weren't cooperating, especially once you arrested them. They were willing to go to jail for 10 or 20 years and do their time. Um, it was later when, you know, Sammy the Bull and, and a lot of guys started to flip that that changed, but that was after my time. I had already left and gone to work with the Jamaicans. Um, but the Jamaicans would, um, because mainly uh, they were facing Title 21 drug charges, which carried much, much stiffer penalties, um, and they were mainly in the crack trade, and the crack guidelines on the sentencing guidelines on crack were very, very tough. So most of them never faced those guidelines. Most of them cooperated. They got their 5K letter, and, and they got a break from them, which allowed the judge to depart down on the sentencing guidelines. And so the guidelines were really only a, a hammer over their head that 95% of them never faced. I think my, my first indictment on my, that the gang case that I was talking about, I think we indicted 54 people, and uh, we went to trial on six. We had 48 people plead out or, you know, not all of them cooperated, um, but most of them did. That was the main difference. And the other difference was the, simply the level of violence that the Jamaicans were willing to, to engage in. The Italians knew that, that it wasn't good for business to, to be violent towards police. And, uh, you know, that was something they learned over decades and decades and, and generations. Um, the Jamaicans, uh, you know, most of my subjects were born and raised in Jamaica, a violent place where they didn't respect the police there was a high level of corruption the police down there you know so they brought that kind of uh attitude with them to the streets of brooklyn and and, Bro and the bronx those were the two main differences when i went over to the, the the jamaicans 
the good the good difference was we were able to get a lot more cooperators. The bad difference was that even on a surveillance, you always had to have your head on a swivel. They you know whenever you chased them. I mean I I don't think I ever arrested a guy a Jamaican that did not have a gun on him. Um, you know, and, and some of them resisted and we rolled around. I remember rolling around on the streets, you know, with these guys and the gun would come out of his waistband and, and things. So, I mean, it was, you know, it was commonplace, that, that kind of, that kind of thing. Now, was there a particular head of the family? You know, was there a Don in the Jamaican? Yeah, gang? there was actually. Um, and all of the gangs in Jamaica, in the Jamaican gangs in New York, were all tied to a particular neighborhood back in Kingston, Jamaica. You were, if you were a shower posse guy, you came from, you know, a certain neighborhood. If you were a gullyman posse guy, you came from the gully, the neighborhood, or, or you know, or Tivoli Gardens, or you know, one of the Kingston slums. And uh, and so those, the gangs would form down there, and and that would be their base. And when they set up operations in the U.S. in Miami or New York or another city, they would, you know, they would have that affiliation. And I used to, yeah, that's pretty interesting yeah. because yes, in Philly, like you might have a, a a gang affiliation because you're on a particular corner in the neighborhood, but the corner in the neighborhood for the Jamaican gangs is back in Jamaica, and that they, served them well because they knew everybody. You couldn't be a member of that gang unless they knew your family back in Kingston. You know, it was you weren't going to fake your way into a gang because it was all family relationship, friend relationship. You knew who. You know, you knew people who they knew. I mean, it was a very uh, tough thing to penetrate because they all knew each other growing up. And I think right. that that was one of the reasons it served them well. The other one was I quickly realized that there, you know, just like the U.S., there were two major political parties in Jamaica, the JLP, the Jamaican Labor Party, and the PNP, the People's National Party. And all the gangs were affiliated with one or the other. We noticed a lot more violent activity in the U.S. even around the Jamaican elections down in Jamaica. The, the, the gangs would be shooting it out in New York about the election that was about to take place in, 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 in Jamaica. You know, that was, it was a learning process over a couple of years, but after a while, you know, when I'm sitting in an interview with a Jamaican guy and, and, you know, and I start talking about the JLP or the PNP, you could see them immediately change their posture. They immediately knew that you know, I, I had a knowledge of some of their inner workings. I, I guess also that really says a lot about the political corruption, where the gangs had an affiliation with the political parties. Absolutely. I mean, you had to know who you were dealing with politically in Jamaica, what neighborhood they were from, you know, and each gang had their own and neighborhood had their own way of doing things. Some were more violent than others. And it was just a, ver a learning process over a number of years. Now, was there a particular gang or a gang affiliation that you were concentrating on and, and what was your success with that? My first case was the Gullyman Posse case and Eric Vassell was the head of that and that's the one that I uh, talked about earlier where the informant came in, uh, the former Jamaican cop uh, came in and, uh, and gave us all the information we ultimately arrested him. But, you know, in that, in that case we indicted, th that was the case we indicted 54 people and we uh, we um, eventually got all of them. Vassal got away, and he escaped on us. The first night, the big takedown, we got about 36 out of the 54. We did uh, 30 simultaneous search warrants in New York, Dallas, Texas, Albany, New York, and other places. But, you know, it was during the, one of those searches that we found numerous photographs of our gang members with the current prime minister of Jamaica. And in those photographs, clearly visible on, on tables in this room were, was cocaine and weapons. Um, when you say current, you meant current at, at the, the time. time. At, the, at right. that time, he was the prime minister of Jamaica. And, uh, you know, the U.S. attorney, you know, it was the time, at the, you know, it was the time period when Daniel Noriega, you know, in Panama was getting indicted by DEA and stuff. So, you know, it, it kind of created a stir that we got these photographs. And I was summoned down to the U.S. embassy in Kingston within weeks of those search warrants and, and word getting out that these pictures were had. And I remember, you know, being a little intimidated, being pulled into the ambassador's office. They wanted to see the pictures. And so they were looking at the pictures. And, you know, these are State Department guys. They don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers. And, and they were looking and trying to see if the photographs could have been doctored. But this was before digital photographs. These were not digital right. cameras. 
you know, these were not doctored photographs. It was interesting to now be embroiled in this political type of thing. They really wanted to know whether we were going to try to pursue the, you know, and, and it was, we were not, it was not that case. We were not going to indict any politicians down in Jamaica or whatever. Only because you didn't have any evidence or right. any... I mean, we anything. had these photographs. Our guys had long moved away from Jamaica. These pictures were from years earlier. Um, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't, the, the, you know, we were not focused on that. We weren't planning on going that, down that road. We had already had the indictment. You know, it, you know, the case had a structure and a kind of a theme already. And this was just kind of a sideshow that came up because we happened to find some of these photographs. And at this point, this is 1990. I've got three or four years in the Bureau at the time. You know, here I am embroiled in this huge indictment, 54 people getting summoned to the ambassador's office of a foreign country. It was it was uh, it was quite the learning experience. So now you've indicted uh, 54 people. Yes. How does that affect the gang? I mean, are they still operating? This was pretty Have much you- a top to bottom um, dismantling. Yeah, dismantling. In fact, we, you know, out of the 54 people, there were two people at the passport office in New York that were, were under their control that was giving them U.S. passports um, and stuff. And th- we had fraud charges in there because they were they were doing some fraud work. I mean, the, the number of charges in the indictment alone was massive. Here I am three or four years in the Bureau, and I'm walking into a room, you know, this auditorium with, I would say we had about 350 to 400 agents and detectives that night ready to take down. I had just come from the courthouse with all the warrants and, you know, my head is spinning. My SAC is basically standing there over my shoulder. You know, it's, it was a lot to, to deal with. And, um, but yeah, it was a top to bottom dismantling of the, of the organization. You know, people told me later that they thought that the, the movie New Jack City was actually based on this case. I don't know that for, to be sure, but, the, there was a building at the corner of Sterling Place and Schenectady Avenue in Brooklyn. It was a eight-story apartment building, and it ran a block long, and the gang owned it, and we seized it as part of the case. I was working with our forfeiture analyst, an analyst at the time long before the takedown, and the night of the takedown, we seized the entire building. I mean, it was a, a, it was a substantial property that the gang owned, and they had, I don't know, there was maybe there was maybe... 250 apartments in the building um, and occupied occupied and 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 many innocent people so when i say we seized it we didn't evict anybody um but we probably had search warrants for 20 of the apartments in there that the gang was controlling and they had a a elaborate system of traps where they hid the drugs and the, the the buyer would be brought to one apartment and then the drugs would be brought from another and the money would go to another you know so you know, we it was a it was actually a substantial takedown. The target of that building, the SWAT teams and the NYPD Spe- Emergency Services Unit originally had plans to uh, to like uh, fast rope out of helicopters down onto the roof of the building while you know we came up the street and stuff. Those were ultimately scrubbed because literally a, the police commissioner briefed the mayor and the mayor didn't want that scene. He didn't want armed commandos you know repelling out of helicopters and then you know but but it was a major major takedown. Uh, I can only imagine. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, it's, that's the type of thing that uh, TV shows and movie scripts are made of. Um, and you've got to do it in real life. Yeah, and it was, it was, it was the best learning experience you could, you could have. That in the trial that followed, I never learned as much about evidence handling. And pro- I, I approached my work as an agent so much differently after that. The best thing for any new agent is to go through a trial. Um, because it, it, it changes the way you approach an investigation from the beginning and, and, and how you handle evidence and how you handle Elsher tapes and how you, ha- you know, all of that stuff, unless you get a guilty plea or, you know, the ultimate goal is to have all this stuff put before a jury. Well, there are so right. many pitfalls along the way that can prevent you from getting that before a grand jury initially and then the jury um, that you, it, nobody really schools you on those pitfalls, on the little mistakes you can make along the way that, you know, may lead to, to a suppression hearing or something like that. You know, going through that whole process, especially, you know, we only went to trial on six guys, but it was a RICO CCE indictment. So there were many, many charges and, and there were many counts in the indictment and stuff. So, you know, I mean, we had several hundred witnesses. We had, I think, 18 homicides charged in the RICO. Um, so it was a really, a, it was such a great learning experience. I was such a better agent after that case because of that experience. 
And that's great that, as you said, it happened earlier in your career. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. It was very, very fortunate. So, did you continue after that case to, to work? How long did you work on that uh, Jamaican gang squad? Oh, I worked on that for uh, from 89 to 2000, so uh, 11 years. Um, my next indictment after that one was the Heartless Posse. Um, we indicted, I think, 32. That case was actually a joined case with FBI Miami, where FBI Miami was doing one of those uh, cocaine for green card cases. Our, our subjects were in, connect, in contact with the Miami subjects giving out green cards. So our, our subjects were all indicted in a case called Island Green out of Miami. Um, I think they indicted 119 people in that case, and it was all that cocaine for green cards. Um, so, but then we did a separate indictment in New York on the RICO, the CCE, the drugs, the murders, and stuff like that. I think we, it was either 30 or 32 in that indictment. That was my second indictment. So, you know, another big case, another, you know, we took them down in the hotel. We took our case down. We coordinated with Andy Bland, who was the case agent in Miami. Um, Andy was a fantastic agent. Um, former West Point guy, and I think he, he was the AD of training, and then he was uh, SAC de- uh, Houston. We took our cases down simultaneously, and so we did one of these cases where um, we had a we had a uh, hotel in Kennedy Airport, uh, the Holiday Inn, and we had two rooms. Uh, we had an adjoining suite where they are undercover. We had a Jamaican agent who we had inserted as an undercover, a fantastic agent, fantastic undercover. Um, and he was born and raised in Jamaica, so he knew the, the he knew the how to how to get in with these guys. And uh, he was such a good eight undercover that he was used on uh, by the Italian squads. He was used by the Russian squads. <laughs> he was used everywhere. Hold on, because you were saying that um, one of the reasons the gangs work so well is that they had all these uh, family ties. How come this guy was this this undercover agent? Was able to, to uh, infiltrate the the gang. He was he was from he was from a very small family, and it wasn't in Kingston. It was just outside of Kingston, and his entire family had already relocated to the U.S. I think his his mom, one of his folks was deceased. The other lived with him and his wife. He married a non-Jamaican woman. So he I, I I don't I can't remember what his actual cover story to them was, but I think because he had the dialect and he had the language and he he just like he was was authentic. I was gonna say he was acting but he was so authentic because he was the real deal. I think that they never ever saw him even as a possible. I mean, they probably thought you couldn't be born in, in Jamaica and become an FBI agent, you know, so I can't remember what his exact cover story was, but he was unbelievable. The bravery of, of participating, because you're saying that they're a very violent gang. Um, oh, so yeah. Even yeah. him walking in and sitting down and participating and associating with them, mm-hmm. I and mean, he's putting his life on the line. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and after we took that case down, I got approval for him to, as his handler, I got approval for him to stay home. Uh, he basically worked from his home for six months, or, or more than six months, um, doing all our transcripts, or his transcripts from from all the body recordings that he had done and our Title Threes that we had done. Um, we just got approval for him to work from home, you know, come to the office once a week or, you know, bring the transcripts in because now the U.S. Attorney really wanted the transcripts gone over with a fine-tooth comb over and over again. And there were changes and, you know, markups and things and stuff. So, yeah, so we got him kind of under the radar for a long time. And so we got everybody rounded up and stuff. And then he did some more undercover work for other squads, like I said, some other, you know, things. But he was they always were real careful with him. And then I think he eventually wound up on a surveillance on an SOG squad or something where he was, you know, out of the limelight and out of the But yeah, we we took that case down in that hotel and these guys were all coming in on the last it was the last of a series of transactions. They had the big load of cocaine and they were ready to get their green cards and so, you know, it was one of those things where we had an adjoining room and the, the undercover would say, Okay, Okay, here's the cocaine. Good, guys. Thanks. Let me put this in the other room and go get your cards. And he would go shut the door. We'd have a team in that room come into the subject room. We'd have a team come in from the hallway, and then we took the subjects down. And we did that with I don't know how many subjects. It was basically throughout the day. We started at like 7 in the morning, and we went all the way to like 6 at night. It was group after group after group, and we had a team. Was it like a, appointments? They thought they had appointments? They, had thought to they were all having appointments. Now, only about half of them were our gang, and then the other guys were all being removed to Miami. They were part of the Miami case. You know, we had a team in the, in the, in, in the lobby. We had a team in the parking lot. We had a team across the hall. 
Um, we had the, you know, the room was all wired up and sometimes guys would show up early for their appointment and they were waiting, literally waiting with their cocaine in the lobby of the holiday inn or having lunch at the restaurant in the holiday inn and our guys are surveilling them. And, and, and I remember at one point a guy showed up with his kids that we didn't anticipate. So we're like, Oh my God, what do we do? You know, we just had, you know, we called an extra agent. There were extra agents. We rented another room in the hotel and had the kids. By the end of the day, I think we had like five kids in there. And, right. and in true bureau fashion, the agents that were assigned to like baby babysit these kids, they got called on the carpet by somebody at headquarters because they had rented like six kids movies just to keep <laughs> these kids occupied. And then they, you know, they tried to get reimbursed for these movies, and they're like, "You can't get, you can't rent kids movies." And you know, and we're like, "No, you don't understand." And it took us yeah. so long for those poor guys to get reimbursed for those movies they had rented just to keep the kids quiet. Um, you know, those little stories, you know, I mean, being in the bureau, you yes. have those things. It's just craziness. Let me get a better um, understanding of this. So they were trying to um, swap cocaine for a green card. So I take it it's somebody from immigration that they thought they were dealing with? Yeah. the uh, We had a, a cooperating witness in Miami, and we had our undercover in New York, who was playing the, the, the role of a guy whose family member worked over at immigration. We were working with immigration. And so we got them provisional cards because they tested them. They tested the provisional cards and they actually traveled to Jamaica and back on them. So we had to have these things marked in the immigration system and said, okay, you know, and we said, you know, don't put in there that it's red flag because then you'll have some inspector going, hey, look, this is part of a big, you know, we didn't want anybody to kind of raise up on it at all. So there was a lot of machinations about that with immigration. But you know, immigration agents were working on the on the task force with us. So, you know, it was a lot of coordination on that kind of stuff. But they all had provisional cards, and then they were coming in to get their quote-unquote permanent card when they were ultimately arrested. And this is not something they could have gotten their green card legitimately? Yeah, no, these are all, well, I think the majority of them had felony convictions and had come back into the country. So they were illegal reentries to begin with and stuff. So they were not they were not eligible for the cards they were getting. All right, let me ask you one more question about this. Was this something that we orchestrated, or did you find that there was somebody in immigration who was doing this, selling the green cards for, for cocaine, and then you kind of took it over? Wow, that's a good question. I, I honestly don't know the answer to that, because that end of the case was in Miami, and Andy Bland and, and the Miami agents actually ran that part of the case. So I actually can't, that's a good question. I've never thought of it, but I, my, my inclination or my memory is that there was another case like the one you described where they had a, a bad agent or a bad administrative person and was doing this. And then the Miami division on their task force with immigration said, hey, why don't we use that and the publicity of that case to kind of set up our own thing. So I think in our case, we didn't, have somebody dirty already in there, but we created it based on the prior case and kind of everybody knew about the prior case. So it was actually good that they said, oh, this can happen. You can get somebody in there to give you green cards and stuff. So, uh, What kind of duties and assignments did you have uh, after that? Well, in 1995, while I was still investigating Jamaicans on the, on the drug gang squad, um, an opportunity came up uh, in the New York office to be part of the dive team. The dive team was expanding. They had a lot of work. They couldn't handle it with the number of divers they had. And uh, it was the first time they were taking outsiders outside the special operations branch of the New York office. And stuff. so a couple of our criminal guys got me, and we decided to try out. And in 1990... Were you a, were you a diver? Were you a I, was a rec- diver? I was a recreational diver. And, uh, you know, I learned a lot more once I got on the team because they do a lot more advanced diving than, than recreational. Um and and quite frankly, my first team leader said he didn't want guys that were too advanced in diving because he would have to get rid of all their bad habits. So I was kind of a, I was all right. I was a recreational diver. I'd gone to the Caribbean a couple of times and dove around in Pennsylvania, you know, kind of. And so I tried out for the team in 95 and made it. And then it became a collateral duty. And so I started working with the dive team like once a month. And then when we had cases, I would travel with the dive team. And what would the dive team do? What kind of cases? Well, would- my first real big case on the dive team. So I got on in 95. Well, in 96, we have the Atlanta Olympics. So the dive team is down at Lake Lanier in Atlanta, well, outside of Atlanta, where the rowing events are taking place. And they have these floating spectator stands in the water, which because they float and they hold so many spectators, 
the substructure goes down in the water 40 feet. Well, every night somebody had to get down there and search to make sure nobody got in in the interim and, and planted a device under the stands. For the, you know. So we were diving with the, with the county sheriff's dive team down there. It's a lot of work, and, and we were doing that. Well, we were there for like two weeks before the Olympics. We were supposed to be there for the Olympics, and the week after, or a couple of days after. So the Olympics just get, always open up on a Friday of the big opening ceremonies in Atlanta. Two days before that, on Wednesday, July 17th, I believe it was, 1996, TWA Flight 800 explodes off the, off the waters of Long Island. A, a 747 JFK bound for Paris with 230 people on it. All souls are lost. Every dive asset in the region is deployed out to uh, eastern Long Island, uh, as we are. My first, my first big case on the dive team is a, is a, is a 737, 747 in the ocean with 230 people on it. So a lot of bodies in the water. It was, it was quite a scene to be thrown into. That's how a baptism under fire, so to speak, in the, in the, in the search and recovery world. That seems to be a theme for your career. <laughs> uh, baptism under fire. I don't know why. Being in the, in the right place in a very serious situation where you learn very, very quickly. Yeah. And I mean, we were literally, deployed out there the first night i was actually scheduled to go to atlanta i never made it and our our team split and the team leader sent half the team in that was in atlanta already back up and then the rest of the team joined us after the olympics were over um but we were there for four months diving every day that went what were you committed. doing what was the purpose of your, your your diving at that time you know when it first happened nobody knew what happened it could you know we were considering it terrorism until we could you know, prove otherwise or until we spent enough time looking at it and had no indication that it was terrorism, right? So Jim Kaust from Aradic is working with the NTSB, with Mr. Hall at the NTSB. You know, they're briefing the president every day. They're trying to figure out if this was a diversion and they're going to attack the Olympics, which happens in two days, you know. So it's it was a really high-stress time to have this thing happen two days before the Atlanta Olympics are scheduled to start. You know, and then, of course, you have Centennial Park in Atlanta and you have Richard Rudolph. So, you, you know, there was a lot going on. And we focused on this on, on this just to see we had to rule out terrorism, basically. Um, we had to get as much back as we could. You know, of course, first the first thing was human remains. We had to get the victims back. And so that was the focus of the first couple of weeks and months, getting the victims back. And, and So you were actually diving and searching for body parts. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and we did find many. And, and, and day after day after day after day. A lot of kids. What kind of, what kind of, what kind of, what kind of mental toll does that take? I, I just can't imagine. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it takes a toll. I remember the first little girl I recovered on that. It was my first body recovery and she was 12 years old and she was from Pennsylvania. And, uh, I, I remember it vividly. And I remember uh, there's like certain vivid flashes you get. I remember seeing a flight attendant on the bottom and her blouse was moving. And I thought, you know, that's crazy. My mind is playing tricks on me. And it wasn't until I actually got close to her to recover her that I realized it was because there were, there was, there was, you know, it was fish life underneath that was feeding. And so all of those memories, they never go away. You know, they always stay with you. Little did I know that I would spend the next uh, really 20 in the next 19 years recovering a lot of people, a lot of and unfortunately, most of them children. Later on, on the other dive teams that I was on, we did a lot of child recoveries of, 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 of predator victims and things like that. That TWA flight, uh, it just had an abundance of, of of children and teenagers. There was a whole uh, French class from Matamoros, Pennsylvania, that was going over to Paris for this three-week uh, immersion summer program, right, July. So you have three classes of French high school students. You have their teachers. You have their chaperones, which were their parents. And this small town in Pennsylvania lost literally 30 kids. I don't know how many parents and teachers and, and, and stuff. And, you know, you feel that because, the, you know, the parent, you know, there were other people that show up. I remember one year later, on the anniversary of it, they had a, a memorial service out there. They invited all the divers. They had a huge barbecue, and people were walking around with big buttons of their loved ones who they lost, you know, on their clothing, and they would engage you and want to talk to you about the work you did and want to thank you. And I'm so glad I got to do that, but it's it's not something that a lot of agents experience in, in their careers. Oh, no, absolutely not. 
initially you're going down to recover bodies, but your main goal is to recover evidence, I assume. Oh, yeah. And, and after four months or, you know, the, the, the weather actually into November got too bad and we started losing too many dive days to, to the weather. And then they had trawlers actually drag the bottom. We had ERT people on those those uh, those boats all winter, the winter of 96 into 97. They, and they were rough seas, and those poor guys were getting sick all the time. And they would they would drag the bottom with nets and stuff after you know. But in the end, uh, the engineers told us we got well, we got all 230 victims back. Wow! And we got fantastic. And we got 90 percent of the aircraft back. And the aircraft now has been reconstructed and sits at the NTSB museum in Virginia. And people. And what was the and what was the final uh, outcome of that? The final outcome um, was uh, it was a faulty wiring harness that was run at that time through the uh, center fuel tank of the 747. And uh, as odd as it sounds, 230 people is a very uh, light flight for a 747 yeah. going to Paris. So that was um, you know they flew with the center fuel tank empty on those flights to be more economical. And so, you know, as most people know, uh, a, a fuel tank full of fumes is more combustible than a fuel tank full of fuel um, mm-hmm. because the, the, the compressed gases in the tank become more of a bomb. And when they went back and looked at other 747s that came off the line in, in that generation of, of, of aircraft, they saw a pattern of fraying in the, in that, in the wiring. That plane was delayed on the ground at Kennedy Airport that July evening they had the air conditioners blowing. They overheated the, 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 the systems in the plane. And when it got to about 13,000 feet, there was a spark that ignited the center fuel tank. One of the changes the, the FAA and the NTSB instituted after that was those planes flew with full fuel tanks all the time, no matter what load was on there. It could be five people on a plane. There was, that fuel tank was going to be full. Interesting enough, another kind of side note on that was there was an agent Newark division whose wife was a flight attendant for TWA, and that was her first international flight, and she was lost on that flight. Oh. Yeah. So this, this is really fascinating because I don't think many people understand that the FBI has a dive team. You, know, you hear about our ERT, which is just the evidence <laughs> response team. You hear about HRT, which is the hostage rescue team. But it doesn't sound like what, what's the official name of the dive team? Well, it's the Underwater Search and Evidence Response Team, or USERT. Um, USERT. And we're actually administratively under ERT, and all the dive teams are co-jointly housed in their field offices with ERT. And we go through ERT training, and we're we're uh, funded forensically by the lab. We get forensic training, um, so we're forensic divers. We're underwater crime scene experts. And I always say, like, what ERT does above water we do below water it, it's not they do a lot more analysis than we can underwater but um but yeah we're funded by ertu and and they have an ssa at ertu that covers the dive program and stuff that started in about 2000 2001 when i was actually the the team leader in new york i had descended to the team leader position at the time and in new york we had the only dive team uh, the only official dive team uh, there were some swat teams that did some diving and stuff but um we had the only officially sanctioned dive team in New York. Well, the lab, we started getting so busy that the lab said, okay, we want to take what you've kind of built in New York and we want to replicate it in three other field offices, Washington Field, Miami, and L.A. And so I spent the time from 2000 to 2003 not only running the New York team and doing all our missions, um, but traveling to those three other field offices and setting up their teams, buying their equipment selecting their members, uh, setting up their training courses and things like that. So uh, those three years were, were just a blur because of the, that kind of activity. And then at the end of 2003, we had the other three teams set up, and now the Bureau has officially four dive teams in those offices. And before that, the New York team would be deployed to anywhere in the country? Anywhere in the world. In the world, yeah. okay. And now it's that way, except the. You know, if you notice, the four field offices that the teams exist in are the four field offices that have the rapid deployment program. So Miami, basically, that dive team covers all of South America. The L.A. team covers the Pacific Rim. And New York and WFO, they cover their respective RDT areas of responsibility. Because now all four teams train together all the time. And we have one basic course a year where all the new divers get to know each other and stuff. So where do you train? 
Well, each of the four offices takes a turn hosting the basic course. So it's not, it's not a burden on anybody to do every year. We're a plug and play program. So everybody's outfitted the same and everybody trains the same. So if I was like, there was a case in Anchorage, Alaska, that was my case when I had the LA team, I was short a couple of divers because all of my divers are collateral duty. I was the only full time guy. Well, I could, it was a, it was a be there yesterday type case. And I couldn't get enough divers, so I just call my program manager at Quantico, and he calls out to the other teams and sees who's available. They send me two Washington field office divers. I know these guys because I train them at the basic school, and they know all my guys. So it's we call it like one big team uh, broken up into four areas because everybody knows each other. It's a small program. There are only uh, 60 or 65 divers total in the FBI, you know, so – we're a very small program. Everybody knows each other, which helps us kind of supplement each other's manpower needs, if be. And, and, and it often happens that way. Well, let me ask you, since you were in New York on 9-11 and you're working on a, uh, you know, like you said, essentially a, a, an evidence response team, what kind of role or did you have a role um, at the towers or any of the other locations um, that were uh, attacked? Personally, about a month before the attacks, I was called out to Michigan to do a site survey on a job for the, to help the Michigan State Police on a murder case to find a weapon that was thrown into Lake Michigan. Got my team together, and I said, okay, we're going to go out to Michigan now and do the job. We marshal our, our people. We get everybody available. And four of us are flying out one morning, and then four of us, the other four guys, we always deployed with eight divers. The other four were going to meet us there later that evening. So we were going to fly into Chicago, and then we had a connecting flight into Traverse City. I go to. I was living in New Jersey at the time, as were most of our divers. And I go to Newark Airport, and the four of us get on United Flight 91 on 9/11. Two minutes into the flight, as we're taking off on that very beautiful, sunny Tuesday morning, I look out my window seat, and I see the first plane slam into the North Tower, from a distance of probably two nautical miles. I look back, and about three rows behind me, another one of our divers was looking out the same window in the same direction, and he looked at me, and I looked at him. We both shrugged our shoulders saying, what happened? It must have been an accident. And I knew years earlier a small plane had flown into the Empire State Building or something. And it wasn't long after that that the co-pilot came back out to the cabin, and as you know, the flight crew always knows where all the armed agents are sitting. So she mm -hmm. kind of came, walked through the cabin and signaled to us to meet her in the back. We met in the back alley, and she told us what she knew at the time, that both towers had been hit, that there were over two dozen, maybe as many as 30 planes unaccounted for. It could be that the entire eastern seaboard of the United States was under attack. And we're in this bubble that's moving through the air without getting a lot of, you know, solid information. So for the next hour and a half, we don't know what's happening. But they told us we're not getting near Chicago because that was our ultimate destination. And what happens is uh, ultimately we landed in Detroit, but it wasn't decided for a while. They didn't know where they were going to put all these planes. So they, were, you know, they were scrambling to get everybody down, during which time our pilot was attempting to raise Flight 93 because we were one behind them in the flight path. We were a 757 flying from Newark to Chicago. They were a 757 flying from Newark to San Francisco. They were a transcon flight, more fuel, that's why they were targeted. Because we went through, we went around the same security that they went through. We boarded the plane 30 feet from them at the next gate over. And our pilots, you know, were trying to reach them because they had obviously stopped communicating with Cleveland Center and, and the, other, uh, the other communications uh, systems that were set up to, to get, get them. And, you know, and it was, uh, it was a nerve-wracking 90 minutes that, you still thinking how many people that you know are gone and, and is the whole eastern seaboard under attack. And, you know, the first thing I do is call the Detroit field office. And I said, we need a, a Bue vehicle to get us back to New York. We're four New York agents. And as we're driving back, we're trying to call and we're not getting through and all the lines are jammed. And, and I got to ground zero sometime around midnight, I think. I can't remember, but I just remember standing at ground zero that night. And, and you know, and it was just, it, you know, it's indescribable. And I was sent home and said, you know, show up back up the next day. Everybody had a role to play, and I was assigned to the regular ERT rotation, and that was ground zero, fresh kills, and and the temporary morgue set up. Right. So I did that. After things settled down a bit, I go back to leading the dive team, and that's during the time period where ERTU and Quantico and the FBI laboratory tasked me with setting up 
the other three dive teams. And so I was heavily involved in that, traveling to L.A., traveling to Miami, WFO, and, and going through with their management and stuff how to run the dive team, how to structure it, how to staff it, and things like that. And so I did that, and then we started actually diving again shortly after, you know, into, you know, in, uh, in into 2002, we started diving again and, and, and taking jobs on and stuff. And then I, you know, then I started going to those places and having tryouts. I held the tryouts for the divers in Miami and Los Angeles and started selecting them and, and working with their management to pick their team leaders and things like that. And it was a lot of work for the lab, you know, and I was on the road. I was basically running the dive team as best I could and setting up the other dive teams. And then that that kind of, we had everything stood up by 2003 and at that point, you know, it was one of those logical things where I kind of was exhausted and I needed a change, you know, both from 9-11 because we had lost friends and neighbors in that and and, and other things. And my wife, you know, was in, in, in entertainment. She's a producer and her work was all in Los Angeles and, and stuff. So it was time. And I in 2003, I put in for a transfer to Los Angeles. December of 03, I arrive in L.A. And in January of 04, I'm on a nine-month TDY to Athens, Greece, to do the Olympics. And I did the Summer Olympics there. I did counterterrorism preparedness with the Greek Olympics, with the Greek authorities. And, you know, I actually didn't arrive full-time in, uh, in L.A. until the end of two, towards the end of 2004 because I had that long-term TDY. All right. So when you get to L.A., are you on the dive team full-time? No, I'm on the dive team part-time in L.A., a collateral duty diver like most ERT people are, and I uh, am assigned to the uh, as the RDT team leader on one of those new SERG-type squads that a lot of the big offices uh, were making at the time that has... Like, Could you explain to us what those what those acronyms mean? Yeah, the SERG, SERG is the critical incident response group at uh, headquarters, uh, the FBI's unit that handles a lot of the... Uh, response assets and response uh, elements uh, like SWAT and HAZMAT and, and, and things like that. So uh, some of the larger field offices started actually putting squads together that had all of the elements uh, of SERG uh, at the field office level. So you would have on these squads, typically you'd have a SWAT, HAZMAT, ERT, which is our crime scene people. You'd have special events You'd have uh, crisis management. Uh, each field office handled it a little differently, but, but the, the main um, uh, entities that were on these squads were response-type entities, non-investigative, uh, that the FBI has uh, basically developed more and more of since 9-11 and after. All right. So even though it wasn't di- you, you weren't di- uh, diving full time, this is definitely things that were in your area of expertise. Yes, and and like I said, I I, I, I took over as a rapid deployment team, which is basically there are four field offices that have these rapid deployment teams: New York, L.A., Washington field office, and Miami. And these teams are made up of uh, all the elements that a field office would have. And their responsibilities are basically to go overseas. So each of those four field offices has an air of responsibility overseas. And the rapid deployment team leader is responsible for coordinating if an event happens where the FBI had to send a team that consisted of maybe bomb techs and evidence people and investigators and and different things like that. So you'd have you'd have the RDT coordinator would be responsible for getting all those assets together, uh, coordinating the transport and the uh, all the different things that would, it would take to get all those assets, uh, you know, into that into that uh, area of responsibility. Was there a time where you did begin working on the dive team full time? Yes. Um, and in 2005, I was uh, sent to Iraq to uh, conduct a four month training uh, course in counterterrorism for the Iraqi police and military. Then in 06, uh, as part of the dive team, I went back to Iraq on a special mission at the request of uh, the Pentagon. Uh, and then in 2007, our dive team leader in L.A. Uh, took a transfer to the Mobile Field Office. And so that opened up the dive team leader position. I applied for it and was selected. And so then I took over in 2007 as the full-time team leader of the dive team in Los Angeles. And I guess you were very busy then. Yes. I mean, uh, from 2007 all the way through to you know when I retired in 2014, uh, the, the work load steadily increased but yeah it was it was it was it was good solid work and it 
it was just busy all the time. When you talk about being busy, can you just quickly go over some of the cases that the L.A. dive team uh, was involved in during that time period? People, I think people might remember the Lacey Peterson case. Uh, she was killed by her husband, Scott Peterson. She was eight and a half months pregnant. We, we went up to San Francisco and we did that case. Um, we went to uh, North Dakota and drew... Drew Sujin case, she was a girl who was abducted by a, a predator and, and murdered and, and, and thrown into the water. Um, we did the Chelsea King case, who was a high school runner in San Diego who had uh, gone out for an afternoon run and was a victim of a predator and thrown in, in the water, and we recovered Chelsea. Uh, my last case, uh, the last big case, uh, was uh, Israel Keys was a serial killer. Anchorage, Alaska, FBI Anchorage gets the case. She, he abducts uh, a 19-year-old girl, Samantha Koning, from her uh, coffee. She was a barista at this uh, kind of a parking lot coffee kiosk, and uh, he abducts and, and murders her, dismembers her, and, and secretes her in a, in, under a frozen lake 40 miles north of Anchorage. Um, we're called in on that on a Friday. We're there Sunday. We recover her Monday, all five pieces of her. Um, he is in the of FBI Anchorage and then admits that he's killed many, many, many people over the years. And he gives us two more cases that then I fly to New York and help the New York team in upstate New York and we recover murder weapons and two other cases that he gave us of murder victim. I think Anchorage had the case and I think he gave up 11 murders, but we probably think he was good for upwards of several dozen, um, but he killed himself in jail before he could completely give us all of his victims. Wow. And were there any more uh, bodies recovered of, of the victims? No. The, the, the upstate New York case was an elderly couple he had killed, and he, uh, where he put them, they tracked to an abandoned farmhouse, which was demolished. ERT did one of their big um, landfill searches for months and months on that case, and they never could find those victims. It's, you know, it's the typical stuff you normally see on criminal minds, but this is real stuff. Well, you do mention, uh, you just mentioned criminal minds, and so that takes us into um, the next phase of what you're doing now. So you retired uh, as the uh, team leader of the Los Angeles Dive Team in uh, 2014, July of 2014. And um, what's the connection now with criminal minds? Well, in, in July of 2014, I retired and immediately moved to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, where my Wife is the executive producer for sport presentation for the uh, upcoming Summer Olympics. It's her ninth Olympic Games, and uh, so we we moved down here with our two rescue puppies. And um, I was enjoying retired life until I got a call from Tim Clemente and Jim Clemente, uh, both former agents and uh, work in television. And uh, Jim is the main consultant and a writer on the Criminal Mind series. And so they asked me if I was interested in becoming a technical advisor on a new Criminal Minds spinoff series called Criminal Minds Beyond Borders. And so last August, August of 2015, I started making trips back to L.A. and working on this new series, Criminal Minds Beyond Borders. Our team is the same type of team that's on the main Criminal Minds series. Uh, it's a behavioral analysis unit team of criminal profilers. The difference being our team handles all the overseas cases. So each episode every week goes to a different country. So our, our new show, Criminal Minds Beyond Borders, premieres next Wednesday, March 16th at 10 p.m. on CBS. Okay, I'll be watching. Great. Well, this has been fascinating. You have had an unbelievable career. This is probably going to be the longest episode that... I produce, but I think I don't. I, I don't see how I could cut any of it out. Okay. Um, thank you um, for skyping with me from uh, Brazil, and I'm very proud of your service, and I know you must be too. Yes, very much so. Even after you know you're not no longer an agent, and so it's still important for us to put a good face on the bureau and to to make people aware of the good work that's being done. 
And that's the end of the show. Don't forget that photos and links to newspaper articles related to this interview can be found at jerrywilliams.com. Today's episode was sponsored by fbiretired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.